Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm Lisa Kingo, the CEO and Executive Director of the United Nations uh, Global Compact. Welcome to an informal conversation about leadership in the perspective of COVID-19. Uh, today, we are hosting multiple Global Compact Academies together with our local networks on this key topic uh, across the world. In China, in Asia Pacific, in the Middle East, in Africa and in Latin America. And I would like to welcome you now to the European session where we have a fantastic panel. So um, allow me to welcome our panelists, uh, Franz Timmermans, Executive Vice President for the European Green Deal, uh, at the European uh, Commission, Olga Algerova, uh, uh, Executive Secretary at the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, Franz van Houten, the CEO for uh, Royal Philips, and Victor Smith, Executive Chairman of NetGuru. So in February, Global Compact launched a COVID-19 call to action based on our 10 universal principles to offer a frame to businesses across the world to take action on the pandemic towards employers, towards their supply chain and all other stakeholders. The UN Secretary General, Mr. Gutierrez, has called the COVID-19 the fight of a generation and the raison d'etre for the United Nations itself. And he encourages the global community to build back better, anchored in the 2030 Agenda and in the Paris Climate Agreement as the road to recovery. Um, to our audience today, thank you so much for submitting great questions prior to our event. We have tried to build them into uh, the conversation that we will have over the next 45, uh, 60 minutes. Before we get started, uh, I just want to bring your attention to the fact that we have simultaneous French translation available for this uh, session. So you can select your uh, channel, I believe, at the bottom of your screen for French language if you want to do so. Um, we are ready to get started. And um, I'm keen to ask our panelists first, what the immediate learnings from the COVID-19 um, pandemic has been and uh, how we can bring these actions into um, building a better future in, in Europe. So, um, Mr. Timmermans, welcome. It's an honor to have you on the panel today. Thank you. Um, May, may I start with you? So, from the perspective of the European uh, Union, what are some of the major lessons learned in your mind from countries' response to the pandemic, to the crisis, and also what has it taught us in terms of the importance of multilateralism? Well, I think, first of all, we've learned that, uh, of course, there are national differences. And in our response, national differences will be taken into account, even regional differences. But at the same time, uh, we've seen again how dependent we are on each other and that we need to find common so uh, solutions to common problems at a continental scale, and I would even argue at a global scale. Uh, my other lesson I've learned is the incredible heroism uh, of the first responders, of people working in healthcare, who, who selflessly uh, tried to save so many people and were so successful. The resilience of social systems um, and the strength of, um, I think, societies where social systems are entrenched into the way societies organized and the values that are shared by citizens. Um, I think there is also clearly an understanding that we have a problem with our relationship with our natural environment, that we are more vulnerable than we thought, 
and that we need to find solutions to reduce our vulnerability and to increase our resilience, which is a more positive way of saying it. And finally, I would say uh, what we've also have learned that we really need a strong multilateral international system uh, to be able to respond uh, to pandemics that really don't discriminate uh, between nations uh, and between continents. So these would be my, my first uh, takeaways. I mean, there's so many more things to say, but these would be my, my first few lines on, on uh, what we've learned so far. Thank you so much, Mr. Zimmermans. Um, I think your, your, your points resonate so well. And Ms. Uh, uh, Ayala Ruba, um, I, I, I want to hear your perspectives from, uh, from the UN. I mean, you, you run a very important organization that is based in Geneva. But how, do, how would you define the key learnings and also the social and economic consequences that we have seen from the pandemic. Good afternoon, Mr. Timmermans. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you, Lisa, for giving me the floor. So from our perspective, uh, and uh, I believe everybody would understand the impact of COVID-19 is multifaceted. So first, we see the health impact. Just the UK, Italy, Spain, France alone account for over 110,000 deaths. Second, we need to speak about economic impact. Uh, the GDP is expected to contract significantly. Projections range between 5 and 12% just in Eurozone, making this one of the worst recessions since World War II. Unemployment and poverty are rising with many unable to work. Last but not least, uh, socially, the crisis is creating our compounding inequality Students who cannot afford computers cannot access online education. Gender-based violence has risen in confined populations, with many in informal employment losing their jobs. Income inequality is exacerbated. More and more people are now being left behind. In terms of lessons learned, we see a need for governments to work together to reduce this uncertainty. There is need for a human rights-based approach to eradicate these inequalities I mentioned. We witness that international cooperation can minimize disruption and cost. We need it also at the UN sometime, especially at the outset, to put international solidarity and multilateralism first in our responses, and subsequently our action aligned. Yet there is still scope for further improvement. The pandemic has shown that we can do things to mitigate and possibly even prevent certain risks from materializing it if we have the political will to act. And we must also act upon our knowledge more decisively and swiftly. We had a lot of information in advance about potential risks, yet we didn't always act on it and lost precious lead time for risk avoidance and mitigation. This lesson is true, not just for the pandemic, but also for the crisis of climate change. We saw how suddenly the COVID crisis started, how quickly it mushroomed. Climate change will cause hundreds of crises that start and grow just as fast. So this crisis has shown that environmental disruptions can wreak havoc with the global economy. They can no longer be ignored. Policymakers need to factor in nature protection and restoration. If we want to protect future generations, we need governments to show the same kind of political will and decisive actions to address climate change that we have seen in recent weeks. Citizens, businesses, all sectors of society must demand this from their governments. Let me stop just by the pollution. So this is one of the lessons learned. Uh, we have seen how quickly pollution trends were reversed around the world once polluting activities ceased. We can smell the clean air and people in northern India, for instance, can see the Himalayas for the first time in 30 years. We have the tools to mitigate and even reverse climate change. We just have to be willing to implement them. My last uh, thought goes to Mr. Timmermans because uh, 
I read your recent op-ed written with Bertrand Picard. You talked about the need for the Green Deal in Europe, for a circular and sustainable economy, for replacing old and polluting infrastructure with a modern, clean and efficient one. I couldn't agree more with you. The United Nations speaks of this as building back better. UNEC and the EU already have an excellent collaboration on issues of clean energy and just transition. And we greatly appreciate also your financial support to our activities. And we stand ready to do even more with you on this front. This would be my entrance to this question. Thank you. Go back to you. Thank you, Thank you so much. So political will is crucially important. Um, Let's turn to our panelists from the private sector. So, Mr. Van Houten, may I ask you, so three months ago, we basically didn't have an idea that we would end up in a situation like this due to COVID-19. How has it been to run one of the biggest companies in the world during such a crisis? Um, what have you done to mitigate the business risk and taking care of your people and you know what has been your main learnings thank you uh, lisa um well for everybody in the call uh, let's first explain that philips is a health technology company uh, we uh, develop and manufacture health technology such as diagnostic equipment uh, patient monitors ventilators uh, informatics to enable care providers to work together and engage patients and we became first engaged with the COVID situation already late January, as we have large operations in China, uh, about 15% of the company. And we immediately saw that we had to, to ramp up to deal with the severity of the crisis. And, it, you know, the natural reaction, of course, in the crisis is to take shelter. And many of the government uh, indications were to go into lockdown. But we had to do the opposite because there is a great need to support all the caregivers to take care of the patients. So we formulated what we call the triple duty of care. And we socialized that with all our 80,000 employees. The triple duty of care is first to deliver to our customers who need to support patients. So taking care of the customer needs. Secondly, to protect, of course, the health and safety of our employees. Even though we have 6,000 field engineers that go into hospitals every day to support uh, diagnostic equipment, monitors, ventilators, uh, where all the, the, the contagious patients are. And thirdly, to ensure business continuity. Now, as the pandemic spread, um, the demand for all the acute care um, equipment went up and we have seen a approximately eightfold increase in the needs. And that means part of the business was affected and went down. Part of the business went massively up. And so we had to reassign people uh, from one part of the company to the next part, even though we were all kind of working from home. And what, what is amazing, and I'm very proud of the, the kind of the purpose-driven nature of of the people in Philips where our mission to improve people's lives through innovation now truly becomes alive. And there was no debate that we had to do this. Um, while we were ramping up, we had to navigate uh, partisanship all across the world because governments were saying, well, you know, you produce in my country and all your production needs to go to my people, right? But there's scarcity. So we had to formulate a kind of fair and equal equipment allocation. And we, we used the WHO principles um, that were published around, you know, fair allocation of scarce materials in this pandemic. And I've been on the phone with government leaders all across the world to explain that that's the stance we take. And that, by the way, if you block global supply chains, you will have the opposite effect of getting anything. You will get nothing. Because uh, let's say we, we are dependent on, we are invert, interdependent in a way, uh, you know, on components and materials from, I don't know, 80 countries in the world. And even though you can have all sorts of academic dialogues, you know, what's the desirable 
uh, sovereignty of your industry, the fact is today we are interdependent and supply chains need to be open. And so we had to do a lot of crisis management to make that happen. But I must say, uh, governments have responded by keeping borders open. We've also had to organize airlifts because suddenly airplanes don't go anymore to carry medical equipment. And so there was also quite a lot of uh, energy behind uh, arranging these airlifts between continents. And so overall, I think we, uh, we have been uh, stepping up to our duty of care. And that's going uh, well. Uh, we do see, of course, that and this, this brings me to lessons learned, is that the resilience of our healthcare system uh, uh, needs to be relooked. Right? Instead of mixing up contagious pa patients with elective patients all in the same building is not exactly the smartest way to run mm. healthcare system. Whereas you can leverage, uh, you know, cloud technology, telehealth. Uh, to make the healthcare system more resilient and less exposed to infection. I think we have to, as we move now gradually into a new normal, uh, have to discuss, you know, how healthcare systems can be organized better. Uh, and their data interoperability and digitization will be a very important aspect of the new, uh, more resilient healthcare system. Uh, so it's going to be a very fascinating time um, which brings us to our core purpose of improving lives. And um, we now see the benefit of embracing, um, in fact, SDGs 3, 12, and 13. I, I'm sure that we come to talk about uh, how, you em how we embed sustainability as well. But we see that being a purpose-driven company makes us actually more resilient for the, for the future. Let me leave it at that for now, uh, Lisa. Thank you so much. That was a very dramatic story. I mean, I can only imagine how busy everyone at Royal Phillips have been uh, in, in the recent months. So, uh, Mr. Smith, let, let's, let's hear a little bit from you. I mean, uh, your company is also within technology, but, but from a quite different perspective. So tell us a little bit about the company, what you have been doing, and, and what are your learnings from the recent months? Sure. So yeah, it's definitely going to be a different perspective. So we, we've been uh, in, a, in a very extreme, I would say extremely privileged position. Um, most of the trends that this, this crisis amplifies and, and accelerates uh, have been the, the trends that we've been pretty much betting our, our business on. So, so we're in the business of uh, you know, digitalization and software, um, software solutions and consultancy. And you know, the whole you know, remote work, agility, digitalization, automation, uh, this is all this stuff is pretty much in our DNA. So uh, well, this is something that we've been helping our, our, our clients with. Um, so in this sense, what we try to do kind of internally, and I think it's the, the, the lessons that we've got from there um, was to really act fast. Because of this privilege, we were able to kind of close down uh, our offices and move everybody to work from home, uh, you know, more, more than a week before it was kind of officially mandated. Um, another thing that was super important to us was to over communicate. We are, we are probably two orders of magnitude smaller than, um, than Philips, but still with, with more than 600 people on board uh, across different locations, we really wanted to double down on, on our communication efforts. So we uh, uh, kind of amplified all, all the stuff that we've been doing from monthly to weekly, from, from, from quarterly to monthly. And I think something that's maybe a little bit uh, uh, outside of the of, of this of, of those usual conversations, but something that we always um, was, what we are thinking about was not to panic, in in some sense. So so I think there's this uh, big temptation in, in those kind of crises to 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 pivot a little bit too far and and go maybe kind of outside of of your kind of a day to day values and 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 and, and, pe and things that you do. Uh, for us, for example, it was this, this question about should we go into more of a public space and government uh, solutions. So we, we never done this. It was never a part of our uh, of our offering. But we thought maybe we should do this. We should kind of pivot quickly in, in, in this direction. We decided not to do it. And I think for me, the lesson in, in this was that a lot of the things that we see and a lot of companies who actually go and, and, and are you know, relatively successful or, or, or are you know, handling this crisis well, are the ones to really double down on, on, on their values, on their culture, on things that they're really, really good at. Um, and again, this is a privileged position to be in because, you know, obviously it's hard to stick to your, 
uh, day-to-day uh, operations when you're an airline and, and your, your fleet is, is grounded. But for those of us who, who can do that, I think this is one of the lessons that we had is that really uh, doubling down on everything that we, we stand for. Um, we just got certified as a B Corp. Uh, so kind of also gave us some additional um, tools to be able to do that and, and really stand by our values uh, and, and double down on what we feel are, we are good at was, was, was one, of the, one of the major lessons for me personally. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Smith. That sounds like a very good recipe for everyone in the coming months to double down on their values and, and culture. So thank you for sharing that. So, I mean, things are moving very fast. These days, more and more countries in Europe are opening up more and more. And even though other parts of the world are, are, are still struggling with, with the COVID and, and how to address the pandemic in Europe, it is the sort of reopening that is pretty much on, on the agenda now. So, Mr. Zimmermans, I, I would like to come back to you um, because, I mean, you are playing such a central role in creating the leadership for Europe going forward in, in this space. So, would you please explain a little bit more to us uh, about the Green Deal? and how you see that as a sort of way of building back better for, for Europe and hopefully also the entire world. Well, thank you. Uh, you know, we got the Green Deal because there was an overwhelming support in the European population for doing something about the climate crisis. This was the one issue where almost all across Europe, um, people agreed that we had uh, an urgency and we need to act. One of the effects of the COVID crisis is that, of course, people's priorities have changed. Um, uh, they're thinking about their health first and foremost, and then they're thinking about their jobs and their immediate security, etc. But the climate crisis hasn't gone. It's still there. So I think the big challenge we face now is this. There is a huge investment gap. Um, uh, both public authorities and private, private business will have to make really difficult choices. Uh, how we get out of this crisis because you know the money isn't there so we now will have to mobilize the maximum possible investment capacity we can get and this will give us if we do it right at the european level this will give us a shot at recovery but i fear only one shot because there's only so much burden we could put on the shoulders of our children and grandchildren so if we want to use that shot we better use it well. And the one mistake we need to avoid is to put all that money into restructuring the 20th century carbon-based economy. That would be a tragic mistake if we did that. Uh, we need to make sure both private companies that will have to make very sharp choices about where their future lies, um, financial institutions and public authorities steer our investment towards a sustainable society on the basis i would say in europe uh, uh, of the green deal um, on the global scale we need to look at the development goals and make sure that what we do and the assets we actually put into our society do not become frozen assets within a couple of years time because then we will not have the money to do what is needed and then the uh, climate crisis will remain untackled. And I think it's also a proposition to future generations. Okay, we're putting an extra burden on you now. We have no choice. We need to do it. But we will use that capacity to actually transform our society into a sustainable society. And that's what, how we will now structure the plans for the European Union. Uh, we're, we're hard at work on uh, doing that. And then we will identify some sectors where we will have some priorities. And the three the three staffing positions are the three cornerstones, uh, although you need four, but let me just mention three. <laughs> the three cornerstones are the Green Deal, uh, digitization, and are increasing our resilience. And if, if, if we direct our efforts in that, in that sense, then I think uh, we can come out of this in a strong way. Now, how do we, what are certain areas where we need to pay special attention? I think um, everything pertaining to building and refurbishing is going to be extremely important because if we invest, we also have to create jobs as quickly as possible 
get the economy going as quickly as possible and everything pertaining to building and refurbishing and, and, and making more resilient and making future proof of housing and build an environment is, is a winner for everyone. So that, that we will invest in that. Other sectors, we need to look very carefully at the automotive sector, which is of extreme importance uh, for the European economy. Make sure that we uh, push that uh, sector also into a more sustainable future. And um, well, there's uh, the, the, the transport sector is of vital importance. How do you get that going uh, again? How do you make sure that if you support them, that they also take measures that take them into a more sustainable uh, future? I mean, these are the big, big choices we need to, to um, make now. And I'm, I'm looking forward if there are any questions uh, that are more specific, but I thought I'd just paint a picture more in general terms uh, to start with. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Zimmermans. And um, uh, Mr. Van Houten, may maybe you can pick up from here because you run a large company uh, that has already made commitments to setting science-based targets. So you are already well underway with, I think, some of the energy transition that, that Mr. Zimmermans is looking for. So, you know, how are you doing that in practice? I mean, is there a lot of balancing between short-term and long-term investments or is this part of your overall strategy i mean how, how do you drive this um you know our whole mission statement is to make the world healthier and more sustainable through innovation so sustainability is woven into our strategy it is not an afterthought it is not a secondary obligation uh, we have integrated that and um, we are well underway to become carbon neutral in our own operations uh, by this year. Almost all our electricity consumption, our energy consumption is from green electricity sources. It's a commitment that we have made because we believe in it, right? And likewise on secularity, uh, we, we are increasingly asking our customers to give the equipment back after the economic life of the product so that we can refurbish, reuse, recuperate scarce materials. We have a zero waste to landfill policy. Right? So maybe I can lift it one level up because I believe that it's all about leadership. And we heard that from Victor, uh, from Franz, you know, we need people to stand up and take a stance and say, here's where we go. Right? And we diligently go there. And I have a strong conviction that sustainability doesn't have to be more costly. Uh, in the end, it will become a growth booster. It will become a profit booster. Uh, undoubtedly, with carbon pricing and maybe uh, you know border adjustment uh, uh, tariffs uh, around a green deal, the companies that have progressed further will find themselves in a advantage. Uh, and I have no problem also, and I believe it is good to shorten supply chains, right? Because that in the end will uh, make the world more resilient. I don't believe in closing borders. So shortening and reshoring for me is not the same as to say we need to have independence. Right? I believe the world will remain a multilateral collaborative interdependent operation, but we don't have to ship everything three times around the world. Right? So now if you put a, a price on all the waste, the market mechanisms will actually turn that into an advantage for the innovators. Right? And I very much believe that innovation is a consequence of leadership, right? making choices about your values and where you want to go. And that's what we do at Philips and it's working out very well for us. And also we have no hesitation whatsoever that we stay committed on this path. So there's no, no hesitance that, oh, now we're in a crisis, we need to stop mm. our sustainability commitment. No, not at all. Right? There's, that doesn't even come up as a, as a discussion. Right? So we stay fully committed. And if anything, there's only forward. There's no backward in, in, in our plans. Well, that's definitely good to hear. Ms. Um, uh, the the UN Secretary General, is very firm that the road to recovery has to include the 2030 agenda with the 17 global goals and of course the Paris 
climate agreement. But you know, from, from your perspective, how can the 17 goals be driven more clearly, more, more firmly across Europe to really, how should I say, be the foundation of building the sort of post-COVID reality in, in Europe? It's a very powerful agenda that requires a lot of radical innovation. And we are not faring so well on the goals, at least before the COVID. I think even worse now. So what's your take on the future of the 17 goals? Yes, Lisa, you are speaking about uh, building back better with the help of uh, SDGs. As we see, the pandemic has devastated economies that, and huge rebuilding efforts will be necessary when it's done. And correctly, you said our Secretary General has identified this as an opportunity to create more sustainable, resilient and inclusive societies. We don't have to go back to our old bad habits. And by aligning rebuilding efforts with the SDGs, we can indeed build back better. The SDGs offer us direction on how to redress challenges or prevent certain unwelcome developments. Now we have the decade of action because till 2030 we have uh, just 10 years to accelerate implementation of the SDGs. And it's upon us to make the 2030 agenda a reality and we want and need to do it now. So let us rethink, reconnect and rebuild together. Helping countries rebuild after crisis is something what we at UNEC has experienced with. Indeed, UNEC was founded in the wake of World War II with a goal to promote economic cooperation, integration in the pan-European region. And for over 70 years, and even during the height of the Cold War, we have been bringing the East and the West together to collaborate peacefully on technical norms and standards. We work in several fields such as transport, trade facilitation, statistics, environment, housing, etc. And this mandate remains as relevant as ever in the face of the current recession and the need for subsequent rebuilding in alignment with SDGs. Governments, for instance, are now using directives to many different sectors as they reopen for business. I hope they use this opportunity to encourage the discontinuation of old harmful habits and enact stronger policies and incentives. And for this, the SDGs provide an excellent foundation. Why? They facilitate connectivity, address transboundary and other risks, support a green, circular and resilient recovery. And I would like to stress the word resilient. Implementing the SDGs means that we will be better prepared to respond to and recover from future crises. How? Let me give you some examples from the work of UNEC. We are one of the five regional commissions of the United Nations and we provide a political platform to develop joint responses in a multilateral context based on broad multidisciplinary technical expertise. Our work is always demand-driven and responsive to emerging trends. Through the co collaboration of our 56 member states and often even the larger UN family, it is more far-reaching and impactful than individual action. Moreover, we can offer a number of instruments that are already a meaningful response framework to certain aspects of COVID recovery. One example could be the UN classification system for sustainable resource management called UNFC or framework classification. It applies to oil, gas, renewable energy, nuclear fuels, minerals and others and reduce carbon footprint by optimizing their management, thus helping the circular economy. This UNFC supports several SDGs such as SDG 7 on clean energy, SDG 10 on infrastructure, SDG 13 on climate action, etc. And the EU notably uses UNFC to manage the critical raw materials needed for batteries and also financially supports our work. But UNFC is also relevant in the COVID context. Hospitals had 
shortages of critical medications such as anesthesians. And European manufacturing is hampered by a dependence on imports of active ingredients from China and India. Applying our UNFC can secure the supply chains for these raw materials used in the pharmaceutical industries. This is also relevant to mass scale vaccine development. Another example we work on mm -hmm. is, for, yeah. is, for instance, uh, I will finish already. I would like Thank to bring you. SDG to zero hunger by tackling food loss and waste along the entire agricultural supply chain. In times of crisis, it's of course even more important to ensure food supply and avoid panic. And last but not least, also both Franz Timmermans and uh, Franz von Huyten uh, mentioned transport and connectivity and Franz von Huyten was uh, told that he doesn't believe in closing borders. And this was our first emergency response uh, because we are very strong in inland transport and uh, we tried to open this gr those green corridors so that essential goods could get to, to the population in the region. Thank you. Come back to you, Lisa. Thank you so much. I mean, it's good, very good to hear these concrete examples of how the UN is helping create common standards, which is really what, what, what we will need going forward. So, so, Mr. Smith, if I may come back to you. So, you are running a hugely interesting, fast-growing company. Um, you, you are dealing with the global goals in your daily life. It's part of your business. You were just certified by the B Corp, which is definitely not an easy thing to do. So, please share with all of us, I mean, a modern lean company today. Uh, how do you really use the global goals to, to build your business for the future? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, again, I, I, we are in, in, in a space that, that's, that has huge privilege in this, in this kind of new reality. And I, I think I would say that there's not going to be this, I mean, all the world is not coming back. I think this is something that um, I think it's not particularly clear to everybody. Uh, when I have conversations with folks, they, they, they think about how can we go back to, to the normal. I don't think there's going to be back to back to uh, back to whatever was before the crisis. I think there's going to be a new normal, and we spend a lot of time thinking not really how to how to go back to it, but like how can how can we win in this new reality? And obviously, from a business perspective, it's a little bit different than than from the kind of the public uh, public perspective. But I think there are some lessons, and and we should spend some time figuring out you know what this new reality should be, and how can we how can we leverage this. I think obviously the the, the new green um, the European Green Deal is is one of those kind of examples. But I think you know we can we can also think about smaller things like how can we maybe cut on business travel? How can we have the the EU institutions have more events like that and 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 you know kind of save us a little bit of time and a lot of uh, carbon on 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 our flights between Brussels and and New York and uh, wherever everybody here is because I don't I don't really know where, where people are. Uh, to be honest. And then I think this is one of those uh, moments in time where we have this equalizer on the digital space where everybody has to be in, in this reality uh, and we don't really have to go to Brussels. We don't, we can't really go to Brussels uh, for some of those meetings and maybe we can learn from this and figure out how can we be more sustainable also in this aspect. Like for us, uh, you know, we, we identified um, our, our SDGs that we want to focus on and, and similar to what, what Franz was saying, we, we don't think we need to change those. We, 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 we're going to double down on, uh, on the direction that we had um, previously. And uh, I think this is something that, that the conversation that we might have as a European community, uh, how can we work together better in the future? How can we prepare for some of those crises? Because they're, they're going to come back and, you know, it's, it's going to be a pandemic. It's going to be something else. Uh, so far, from my you know, limited historical knowledge, I, I, I think that, that uh, since the creation of, of European Union, every single crisis made uh, EU stronger, which I, I hope is going to be the case here as well. Um, and if we can leverage those, uh, those learnings, those lessons learned and, and figure out how can we be stronger in the future, how the business can be stronger, how the, how the, um, the union can be stronger. I think this, this would be a, a really good outcome of this, of this strategy that, that we are experiencing right now. Mm -hmm. 
Elisa, can Thank I uh, echo uh, a point that Victor is making? If I'm honest, then uh, I said, you know, we are progressing well in sustainability of our operations. But the one area that we were weak on was business travel, right? And um, we kind of addicted to business travel. And I think what the crisis has, has taught us is actually the company functions fine without business travel, uh, at least for, for meetings and executives and so on. So I think we're going to cut down massively on business travel. Right? And I find it a shame that, that that's a kerosene and so on is actually not taxed. Right? And I, I see here in the, in the Zoom chat, you know, that if you want behavior change, you need to, of course, put incentives and disincentives on the things that you want to influence. And uh, I think we all now need to avoid, we go back to normal on business travel. And that would be a nice area for, to, to have some leadership there. Yeah. Of course, using the nice tools from the, uh, the, the, the cloud community there. Yeah. So, so Franz, uh, let, let me pick up from there because um, we, we are getting closer to the end of, of our conversation. And I thought it would be really nice if uh, each of you could share your vision for what kind of leadership is needed in Europe going forward. Um, I mean, in a way, it's, it's good to look back, as Mr. Smith is saying, that uh, Europe has been bouncing back stronger many times in its history. How can we make sure that happens again and that we just don't slide back into the old normal instead of taking the opportunity to push into a, a new normal? So what kind of leadership is needed and, and, and what is your advice to, to our audience today? Mr. Timmermans, may, may we start with you? <laughs> well, thank you very much. That's a tall order. Um, well, I would say yeah. that the one, thing, the one thing we need to fix as a European in our societies, and I'm sure it's not just in Europe, is the fact that we are being crippled by what I would call moral hazard. Uh, there is a lack of trust between us. There's a lack of trust within nations. There's a lack of trust between nations. And this, to, to some extent, is a direct consequence also of earlier crises, uh, where people have felt left behind, ignored, um, not part of the solution. So if we want leadership to be successful in the future, first of all, we have to make sure we leave no one behind. Secondly, we have to make sure that forms of leadership are found that are inclusive. Thirdly, we have to make sure that we um, reconnect um, the vastest majority in our population with our fundamental values. Too many people in our societies now are tempted by forms of authoritarian rule, um, by scapegoating other people. So in short, the risk we run now in Europe is that um, because of this crisis combined with uh, the fundamental changes, tectonic changes in our society caused by this industrial revolution. So change is coming from all sides. We understand the climate crisis and that it's an ex that existential challenge. We are starting to understand that, that we're in the middle of an industrial revolution that will change the world fundamentally. We now are confronted with a pandemic and it probably will not be the last pandemic we need to face. So we need to make sure that we have a plan for the future based on an inclusive approach of how we want to organize our society. And we need, I think, to also speak up for democracy, democracy and the rule of law. Without democracy and the rule of law, uh, authoritarianism is going to um, uh, abuse of this situation to silently capture um, uh, an opportunity. And I think, I think I'm, 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 I'm uh, entitled to say that in this crisis we've seen that you cannot solve this problem by blustering, you cannot solve this problem uh, with populist rhetoric, you cannot solve this problem by simply ignoring science. Um, and, and so the idea that competence, respect for facts, putting science first and foremost, but most of all creating partnerships across society are the future of leadership that will deliver the changes we need. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Timmermans. That's a full agenda. <laughs> so, Mr. Smith, what, 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 what's your 
What's your view? What's real leadership in Europe going forward? Look, I, I'm not going to uh, cover it, it, it broadly, I guess, but I think something that comes obviously from my bias is that I think this leadership uh, is going to transition into a more digital leadership. Um, mm -hmm. and, and what I mean by that is that I think, you know, being visible, uh, you know, either internally or externally online as, as, a, as a leader of, the, of, of, of a business or any kind of organization is no longer like a millennial thing to do. I think this is something that we we now all uh, and every leader, I guess, of the last uh, weeks or months experience that they, they, they have to have a way to communicate. They have to have a way of lead, not being physically in the same uh, place or office. And I think this is something that, that, that needs to be, uh, we're gonna stay with us for, for, for uh, after this crisis, among obviously all the other things. But I, I just wanted to mention this part. Yeah. Which can have a huge impact on many, many other things. So, so thank you, Mr. Smith, for that. Uh, Ms. Uh, Aljarova, um, leadership for the future, in your mind? Yes, we already touched a lot of important factors. I really hope that the post-COVID-19 leadership will be conscious of our vulnerability to crisis and take steps to be better prepared, especially in terms of rapidly responding and uh, transitioning to a climate-neutral economy. So circular economy, a just transition to zero carbon energy systems, building resilience and sustainability, PPPs, all of these are needed. And uh, of course the leadership should always keep an eye on the future and focus on bolstering countries' innovating, innovation capacity to enhance uh, sustainable growth. Uh, and UNEC can support governments by, by providing the technical tools to implement them. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, let's remember that we are together in this. We have seen an erosion of confidence in multilateralism in the last few years, uh, but without collaboration and coordination, countries will often work at cross-purpose and miss in synergies. Therefore, I would like to urge here all leaderships to make full use of the collaborative platforms one of them is the UN. We are at your service and together in solidarity, we can reach the future we hope for. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. Van Houten, it's all about leadership. What does it look like? You're muted. Europe, Europe has 500 million people. That's a lot of people. And we've got to inspire them. Right? And to inspire them, you need to have a clear North Star where we are going. Right? Then we need to take the people along. And we need to be competitive as a region, and therefore we need to transform. Right? We cannot hold on to the old things and think that it will be okay. It won't. Right? We need an honest conversation about that. And of course, we need to embrace the future, which is digital and AI and, uh, and a lot of new things. So Europe needs to go on a transformation journey. Right? And it will take very courageous leadership to get there. And um, that's a tall order, as uh, Franz Timmerman said, but we better put our shoulders under it. And then I think we can make it uh, an exciting journey as well. Thank you so much to um, all of you and uh, your great interpretations of what kind of leadership we need for, for the future. Thank you so much for spending a little bit of time with us uh, today. And now I'm really keen to see how other parts of the world are defining the leadership that we need for uh, the future. But thank you so much to our wonderful panel. Um, and I also want to invite you for um, our Academy uh, on Thursday, which is about the global supply chain, focusing on shipping. And on the following Tuesday, we will dive into the business ambition for 1.5 degrees, uniting business to recover better. Finally, thank you to all our audiences today. I hope to see you all at UN Global Compact's 20 year, 20 year anniversary summit that will be digital of course on the 15th and 16th in june where we will debate again 
uh, how we build better and stronger for the future. Thank you so much for being with us today.